So what's happening right now goes far beyond singing songs. And maybe somebody's here is looking around and wondering, why are they closing their eyes or why are they raising their hands? It's because when, when the throne of the Lord comes into a place, we realize, I'm not on the throne of my life anymore. And when we praise the Lord, uh, we are expressing His excellence. We're expressing His beauty and all the things we're thankful for. And how good He is that we don't have to be on the throne of our lives, that He is on the throne and not us. And so when we praise the Lord in times like this, something supernatural is happening as the Lord's throne comes in our midst. And sometimes people bow before the Lord. Sometimes people dance. Sometimes people uh, lay down or, or you're quiet or it doesn't matter. The point is that this is our time to connect with the Lord. This is our time to acknowledge that I am not my own God. That He is God and He's sitting on His majestic throne right here. And that's His mercy and grace that the God who created the whole universe would come and be with us today. So as we sing this again, I want you just to imagine and close your eyes that the throne of the Lord, which cannot even be described, is here with us today. Amen.
here for us in our hearts. And we just, we just are grateful Lord, for what you're going to do this morning as we continue in faith to worship you with everything we do. In your name, amen. You all may be seated for a moment. This is the portion of our service where we show our love and appreciation to our Lord through what's called our offering. Our offering is giving back to the Lord a portion of what he's given us. And uh, we only give a portion. We would have to give everything we are besides everything we have to give back what the Lord gave to us. Scripture says uh, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And so I think about that and I think, well, what makes me cheerful? Well, it comes from my heart. And how does my heart get cheerful? It's all the blessings, all the love, everything poured into me. And when we receive like that, our joy is not full until we return to someone else a portion of what we've received. If you think about it, if you have a heart full of joy and don't share it with anyone, close up, what happens to that joy? It dies in you. It has to be fulfilled. And how we fulfill ourselves in Christ is by giving back in every way we can a portion of what he has given us. So we give back um, to help build the family of God by extending the kingdom. We, we provide a place. We, we provide um, a pastor to shepherd us. And so that's a portion of what we can give back to make sure that we can extend the kingdom of God. But more than that, we give back by loving our neighbor as ourselves, by reaching out to those around us, not just giving back an offering in the church, but helping uh, those around you who are in need. So I just ask you today, bow your head, and let's just thank God for all that we have received. Undeservedly, most of all, we've received your grace without deserving it, because you came when we were yet sinners. And so, Father, we just ask you that whatever we can give you this morning in, in terms of our finances, that you would bless it, you would triple it, you quadruple it, and, um, and that you would bless this body of people and this space where we can come and worship you week after week. And we just thank you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Love 
was for him. But if I look at this God who always was in the eternity past, when he lived in the perfect union, one in essence, three in persons, he could have created the world differently. He could have created beings who have no free will. But then there would be also not the possibility to express and show the deep love he has for us. And I think this is what we need to realize that God's love is beyond our comprehension. It's not that we have loved God, but He loved us first. He did this for us and He's continuing the war. He will finish what He has started in those who truly give life to Him. And I just want to encourage you because we have eaten a life because what Jesus has done and accomplished is finished. We can rest in it. We should also act upon it and act as those who were saved for a purpose, for a purpose which is to spread the gospel, the good news. That, uh, you know, even in the Garden of the Eden, Eden God has announced the good news. When Adam failed, he already said to the serpent that the one who is the seed, who is the offspring of Eve will come and he will crush his head even though he will be bruised. So on the cross, Jesus was crossed, bruised for us, but he has risen. And we celebrate the new covenant in his blood. Now we proclaim his death until he comes. And the risen Lord says that whoever eats my body and drinks my blood, though he dies, will live. So when you're ready, after I pray, please feel free to come receive the Lord's Supper. Uh, here you can see some instructions. We will have two stations. Wine on my on your right side, on your side. Wine here as well. Outside there will be juice. Now pray. Heavenly, gracious, loving Father, we just come in front of you and you want to open our hearts and our minds. We do acknowledge that you have saved us by the most radical way, Lord God. We just try to comprehend what it means to us. We know that uh, you are for us and you are with us. You have given us the precious gift of salvation. You have given us yourself, O oh God. You have given us the gift of the Holy Spirit inside of us. And we just pray, we just ask, O oh God, earnestly, shine the light on the areas of our life where we just try to be ourselves, where we try to walk in dependence on our achievements, where we try to do things on our own, Lord God. Let us, let us repent of that and let us turn to you, Lord God. Let us be those who you who called us to be, your children, the one who are led by the Spirit, as you have Jesus. Jesus, lift your life. Let us be more like you. The example of you is something which we cannot achieve. You have given to us, but we can every day surrender to you and turn to you and allow the Holy Spirit lift through us so that the work of your hands will be accomplished through us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
My name is Mathieu and uh, I have been asked by John or I volunteer. Um, we are trained every week for something outside our congregation so that we are not so concentrated on ourselves. And I have read that again that first of all, then I urge that the requests, prayers, intercessions, and so on, that we should first of all pray for those in authority. So I spent yesterday thinking and praying over this verse again. And it became rather strange to me because um, actually, why should we pray for the people in the um, of this country or why should we pray for governments when after all our citizenship is in heaven and we should be living for this place, we should be living for eternity. And even worse, last week I uh, heard an interview with uh, some pastor who was originally from Midwest and now he was living in Pacific Northwest and he was commenting how it seems to him that a lot of fervor and kind of semi-religious fanaticism which is now present in, in his opinion in the American politics comes from the rise of nuns, people who are leaving churches and who are still uh, they don't have good uh, venue to use their religious fervor so they are putting it into politics and a lot of the fanaticism and uh, extremism which is and uh, inability to talk with uh, the people who disagree with you comes from this kind of semi-religious stuff and which is kind of weird because that's one thing which I read many times in social scientist books that the rise of communism and fascism in the early 20th century Europe was to some part uh, fueled by this uh, similar wave of secularism which was coming, uh, basically the biggest secularization of Europe happened uh, in that the time. And so, I was thinking, and then why should we really care? Should we care? Do we care too much about uh, politics, about the uh, absolute governments? And the verse here uh, comes gives a very limited uh, answer. So that the church may lead a peaceful and quiet life in all goodliness and dignity. We don't care. We don't hope that the earthly governments would give us salvation. We don't hope that the earthly governments would uh, create a heaven on earth. And whoever pushes this uh, agenda or whoever gives more hope to earthly governments than to the uh, Lord Jesus Christ is certainly misleading us to something more than bad. But we need for the church to work as much we are living in, the, in this body, we need peace and quiet life so that we can uh, work on spreading the gospel and uh, sharing the good news with other people. And uh, Paul here, verily, down to the earth, that means that we need the peace and a quiet life so that we can work our heavenly work. Uh, just an uh, inspiration if we don't uh, we should be now praying for this and as an inspiration for if you don't know what to pray for I just picked up the three uh, pieces of news from the what I found yesterday on the news sites one is um, Czechia has the third highest number of students per teacher in Europe the state of the schools in the Czech Republic is not very good and certainly uh, some good politics would be helpful. Yesterday or last week 
over 200 police raids swept over the uh, Fund Against Corruption, which is the biggest civil society organization in Russia. Just information. And the third one is, which kind of relates even to our church, uh, Italy last week allowed uh, migrant rescue ship to dock in Lampedusa, Sicily, which is interesting because one of the friends of uh, this church works there with uh, refugees. So, if you want to pray for this or anything else uh, in relation to the people in authority, let us pray. Please stand up. I press from the Lord to install them as elders of this church, elder couple of this church. And so I'd like to invite uh, Carolyn Kelsey to come forward and pray as well. Speaking of praying for authority in our lives. Read a passage from 1 Peter 5. As a fellow elder, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. Not for what you can get out of it, but because you are eager to serve the Lord. <clears throat> Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your good example. And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. And in the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders, and all of you dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So, let's pray. Lord, thank you for bringing David and Dorothy to this nation from Uganda. That uh, you brought them through as students, and now they're professionals. And thank you for all that they bring to the body of Christ in this nation. Thank you for all their wisdom and uh, especially their heart for students and Lord, all their spiritual gifts that they operate in. So um, we bless them and we receive them as elders of this church. And the authority that comes with that and the responsibility that comes with that, Lord, we receive it, we receive them, and we just speak a blessing on you, David and Dorothy, to be who you're called to be, and to do what you're called to do here in this place, that we are making a place for you as elders, corporately and in our hearts. And Father, we pray protection for this couple as they take this role on. And Lord, most of all, we pray in the church for love and unity, love and unity, love and unity. Anoint them for this position in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, that you have blessed us with this couple who is, um, they're both so dedicated to you, Father, that your spirit lives in them. They live and breathe who you are. Their wisdom is abundant and flowing out. They ask you that we, you will uh, have them guide us with your authority, guide us with your will. Thank you for the gifts that they have brought to this church. And um, just ask that we can listen to your voice that comes through them, Father, as they persevere in, in serving in your kingdom. We just thank you for all you do through them. In Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you for the spiritual mantle of authority that comes from above. We thank you for uh, pouring that out upon them. Thank you for their friendship, their heart for you, and their love for others. They are a great example. Lord, and help us to learn from their lives. Lord, bless this church through them. We thank you, Lord, that they are representative of the whole church here, the whole community, who we are. And we just uh, receive them today as God's appointed ambassadors for this community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give them a round of applause. I'm praying for Pastor. <laughs> Fair enough. Who is excited?
excited to hear from Pastor John and hear from above. So if you don't mind, we can stand up to honor the word of God as we pray for Pastor John. Hear your word, Lord, to receive every blessing, every gift, and everything that you have for us through your servant, Pastor John, in Jesus' name. But I'm, I'm praying for open eyes to see what you see over the lives of the people here. I'm praying, Lord, that every word that will come forth through your servant, Father, will be penetrating into the hearts of your children and that we will receive it with such reverence, O oh God, and praise in our hearts. And there will be freedom through every word that you're releasing through Pastor John this morning, that every need will be taken care of in every way in the name of Jesus. Release your anointing right now over him, Lord, and help him to hear directly from your throne room, to hear what you are speaking to us, Lord, that will be receptive, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, for those of you who are visiting, we're in a series on Gideon. I assume most of you have heard of Gideon, the book of Judges. Yes? Anybody have your own personal Gideon story? Yeah, where you sought, yeah, a sign from the Lord or some confirmation at least. Uh, there's nothing wrong with seeking to know the will of the Lord. That's actually a good thing. Uh, but what about testing the Lord? Should we test the Lord? What does scripture say about that? Yes. 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 No! <laughs> he does say, test me in this, and it's tithing. We can't outgive God. He does say, test me in this. Uh, but actually, it's the devil who tries to get Jesus to show a sign, right? And what does Jesus say? Get behind me, right? Uh, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6, 16, do not put the Lord your God to the test. But that is exactly what Gideon does in the story today. And personally, I don't blame the guy. For me, big decisions need confirmation. Like, for instance, when God called me into missions, I started taking mission trips. And when God called me to Prague, Fortunately for me, God gave me confirmation that this was the right place to be. One of them was Kelsey. I was here meeting with the Czech elders, and I had just started dating Kelsey, and it just seemed like the two callings were on different paths. Like, I felt like I was called to marry Kelsey. We just started dating. I already had that in my heart, and I was called to come here. And so I just, I was in someone's house, and I didn't matter. I just prayed in my prayer language really loudly until I felt like there was a breakthrough. And I knew in my heart of hearts that God was going to speak to Kelsey that day. So I waited. She was seven hours behind. I waited till it was her morning. And I called her up, which was expensive back then. And the first thing I said to her was, what did God say to you in your quiet time today? And she goes, as a matter of fact... I was praying, and God put the Czech Republic on my heart. Now, she had no, she didn't even know where the Czech Republic was. She said, I opened my atlas, and I went and found the Czech Republic. And it's so interesting that you asked me that. And for me, that was some confirmation. There's um, a man named David Snell who's actually in town. He just came back in town. Maybe he'll be here next week. I don't know. But... I got off the plane and he was waiting at the airport and I came out and he said, I knew who you were because I saw you in a dream last night. Wow. Thank you, Lord. God is good. But I don't remember God asking to do something for me to prove that I should come to the Czech Republic. And even with these uh, confirmations or even if God had given me a sign at the end of the day I still had to take a leap of faith to give up my business and to move over here and that's what it's all about is faith right okay well we're gonna I actually have two Sundays to cover because next Sunday we have a guest speaker who chose a different topic so I'm just going to summarize some of these slides. And for those of you who weren't here, I'll catch you up from, let's say, uh, chapter 6. 
I can't go through the whole book here. But in chapter 6, we see, you know, there's a series of judges, and the last judge from, from the last judge, it, Israel had returned back to their idolatry and all the stuff they were into, and God, it says, delivered them into the hands of the Midianites. And that wasn't a good thing. So that was for seven years. And a prophet comes and reminds them, hey, this is because of your terrible sin. And then an angel of the Lord appears to Gideon. He's uh, in a wine press threshing wheat, which doesn't make sense, but he was hiding from the Midianites. Kind of gives you an idea of their circumstances. And there, uh, Gideon was divinely commissioned uh, to defeat the Midianites and to rescue the people of Israel. And it was a clear call. In fact, he said it twice. 14, chapter, it's verse 14, verse 16. And so here in our section, um, we see that uh, Gideon shows real faith here by this is a time of famine. Uh, for seven years, they've been uh, robbed and crops burned, and there's not much of anything. But he takes a step of faith and sacrifices a goat. He bakes bread as an offering. And then the angel of the Lord who's talking to him, he asks for a sign from the angel. And so the Lord, the angel burns up the entire offering right in front of him, which just completely freaks him out. And God's got to calm him down. But he did get the sign he was asking for. So the next section, Gideon builds an altar to the Lord. He calls it uh, Jehovah is peace. The Lord is peace. And that very night, God commands Gideon to pull down this uh, family or community altar to Baal and replaces it with an altar to Jehovah and an Asher bull. So Gideon takes this big, another big risk here by sacrificing his father's bull. Now again, this is a time of famine and bulls are really important to the herd. So this is a huge sacrifice on his uh, behalf. And in fact, I would say that this step of faith is probably bigger than any step of faith that we have taken, anybody here in this room. I mean, this, I don't know how to compare this. Uh, let's say you're an American, and I say American because we really need our cars, and you got saved, and you quit your job at Planned Parenthood, and you gave your car to your church, and you had no backup plan. You know, that's what it's like for this guy. I would have said a check who worked for, what's his name? The politician. Babish, yeah. But giving him up his card in Prague wouldn't be a problem with it. Uh, but giving up your bull was a big sacrifice. Okay. So next, the men in town came to kill Gideon because he tore down this altar to Baal and the Asherah pole, and Gideon's father, Joash, comes and he calms down the angry crowd using sound legal argument. You guys would like that, you lawyers. And his conclusion is, if Baal is really God, let him defend himself. And soon after, the armies of Midian and Amalek cross the Jordan to come back and rob, kill, and destroy again. But then the Spirit of God comes upon Gideon Gideon blows the trumpet, he sounds the call to arms. Okay, and the last part will be cut up. Gideon puts forth a fleece, not just once, but twice. God, show me a sign. And in fact, the, the second time was opposite the first time, and it was opposite what normal phenomena would be. And so God does this twice, and then Gideon is uh, reassured of God's call and will for his life. So here's the application today. Shall we ask God for a fleece? Now, there's some historical examples, actually fewer than I thought. Any of you remember Abraham's servant? I don't know if this is a good example or not. Do you remember what happened? He sent to find a wife for Abraham's son Isaac? Yeah. Yeah, it comes to the well. And he asked if, uh, if she is the one that she should uh, offer me a water. I'll ask him for a drink, and then she should, if she offers to water my camels as well. 
This guy couldn't wait to get back to Abraham and back home. And so he comes up with this idea. As soon as I find someone who says, yes, I will give you water. And by the way, I will water your camel. She's the one. And I'm just imagining there's this angel standing there and going, this lazy servant, you know. This doesn't require God. This just requires luck. And no, not that one. That's his cousin. That's Isaac's cousin. No, don't, don't ask her. And then that's it. She's the one. And the angel has to figure out, okay, we'll just have to do a miracle when she gets pregnant or something to make sure the DNA is okay. But I don't know. It could have been a sign that was confirmed by God. Maybe not. King um, Ahaz... He actually was an evil king, and God, he wanted to destroy Jerusalem, and God wanted to say, uh, you're not going to do that, and I'll show you. And God invites him to ask for a sign. And he's so terrified of being before God, he says, no, I don't need any sign. So a no sign happened then. But King Hezekiah, this was a real sign from God. And in fact, if this happens again, it's probably going to be the end of the world. He asks that rather than the sundial go forward, that it goes backwards. So literally that the sun stops rotating, the earth stops rotating. And God did it for him just to demonstrate that God was going to heal him, which he did. So what about some New Testament examples? Can you think of any? I couldn't either. <laughs> I mean, there was casting lots before uh, Pentecost looking for a replacement elder. That's kind of in there, right? Uh, but twice, we see here in Matthew, they're asking Jesus for a sign, and his response is, an evil and adulterous generation craves a sign. And of course, that evil and adulterous generation is different from a believer who's looking for confirmation from God. We certainly give you that. But the Bible seems to indicate that mature believers um, are actually showing their immaturity when they're asking for a sign. You know, an example would be doubting Thomas. Remember Jesus' response to him? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So it's really an issue of faith. Are we going to believe God for what he said, or are we not? And in Gideon's case, God said it clearly twice, and there already had been a sign where the angel burned up the offering, and then he asked God for two more signs. <clears throat> and I would point out the example of casting lots, that actually occurred right, right before Pentecost. What was Pentecost? Pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Now that we have the Holy Spirit, we can actually hear God for ourselves. That's, that's the good news. So we might say a good rule for us is walk by faith and not by fleeces. Which is kind of a pun off of 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Walk by faith and not by sight. Maybe the problem is not asking for a sign, but how we ask. So we can ask ourselves, are we asking in faith or are we asking in doubt? So in Gideon's case, after I said he's already got uh, twice the word spoken to him, already had a sign, is he act asking in faith or is he asking in doubt? What do you think? Okay, I think he's asking in doubt. I really don't believe what you already told me twice. So I need another sign. <laughs> well, that's my second question. In the fleece throwing, are we attempting um, to seek our will instead of God's? And of course, a great way to do that is, um, you know, God, unless the sundial moves back 10 notches, I'm not going to go. You know, and then you don't have to do what you don't want to do, right? Uh, 
Very often, God has already confirmed His will through His Word, and we're either ignorant of it, or we just don't want to do it. We don't want to submit to His will. And maybe instead of asking for a sign, we should be asking God for more faith. Can I have an amen? amen. All right. Uh, last question is, does our fleecing follow the biblical pattern of Gideon? And, you know, often today people are throwing out fleeces and, you know, it's kind of like Abraham's servant. It just doesn't need God's input at all. You know, if the, if the light turns green by the time I get to the intersection, you know, if, the, if this song comes on the radio, then, you know, we kind of get what we want. Or the name and claim it kind of thing that uh, just the opposite. See, the sun came up. That means God wants me to buy a new sports car. And, you know, we can use places sort of to get what we want, or at least to appease our flesh. So today I want to focus on the topic of discovering God's will in the absence of fleeces. And if we're not going to fleece God, how do we know His will? Well, here are some God-inspired ways. Uh, the will of God can be found in Scripture. You can ask. I don't have time to read the whole slide. You can take a picture of it. Uh, learn, confess, trust, be humble, be obedient, fear God. All these are ways to confirm that God's will will be shown to us. So my first point today is the best way to discover the will of God is to discover the Word of God. Huh. The will of God is not hidden, but it's revealed through the Word of God. In fact, Scripture admonishes us to know the will of God. Do not be unwise, but understand the will of the Lord. That's Ephesians 5.17. Okay, here's a few examples of finding God's will in Scripture. Now, let's assume I gave you guys homework for this week that you're to go find a Bible program and look for scriptures for all of these topics. Okay? That's going to be a very long list of scriptures. And the point is, we don't need a sign from God about something that's clearly indicated in scripture. God's will can be found in God's word. And if you really want to know God's will, while you read your Bible, read it with this question in mind. God, show me your will. Page after page, God will reveal to you something else about his heart. Right? Wouldn't you be surprised if you didn't find anything when you're reading through your Bible? Uh, scripture is clear on most topics. But if you hear, let's say, God spoke to me, I thought I heard God say, and God said, you should date this non-believer. Well, I challenge you, go take what you hear and go search the scriptures on that topic. Because God is not going to speak something to you that is inconsistent with the Word of God. Because Jesus is the Word of God. That's part of who He is. So if you hear something from God and it contradicts scripture, I'm thinking it's probably not God. Sound advice. I mean, some people can twist Scripture, but if we really come to Scripture as a learner rather than trying to support our agenda, God will speak to us through that. Of course, there's people walking around and says, God told me this and God told me that. Uh, but those are the people who fall victim to the deceitfulness of our flesh. Right? Because our flesh is... Everybody's got flesh and everybody's got deceitful flesh. Except for the people that are dead. They don't have deceitful flesh. But the rest of us have deceitful flesh. So, but those of us who determine God's will by the guidance of the scripture are not so easily deceived. Okay, the second best way to discover God's will is through prayer. <clears throat> and if you have trouble praying, some people just don't sit so well, find a prayer partner. Okay? Can I call Deepti on you to read this slide? Forgiveness from God, for instance, without 
also forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from the God's part. Amen. That's from Matthew 6, 14. Mitchell, we need that mic a little harder, please. So there's many types of prayers, thanks, petition, intercession, listening, journaling, praying scripture, lecto divina, waiting prayer, worshiping prayer, healing prayer. There's lots of ways to different pray, and God can speak to us through all of them. And then, you know what they say about prayer? Prayer does not change God. It doesn't change his mind. It changes who? Us. That's right. It changes us. So if you hang out with a missional God long enough, guess what? You'll become more missional, right? If you hang out with a compassionate God long enough, guess what? You will become more compassionate. That's right. Proverbs 3, 6 says, Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He is the one who will keep you on track. So on track means in the center of God's will. If you live your life listening for God in everything you do and everywhere you go, you will find yourself in the center of God's will. That's good news. Olga, can I call on you to read this? With, the, with that microphone? Olga makes this cheese. Okay? okay. Mitchell's. Is this mic working now? Yeah. It's working. Go ahead. A second reason that Jesus withdrew so often was because this was the way in which he maintained his relationship with the Father. He was alone, not simply for peace and quiet, but to commune with God. There in the stillness and silence he could hear God speak to him, and there it was he discovered the Father's will for his life. This, is, of course, was a secret of his ministry. So if you come to God with an open and responsive heart, be prepared for God to download insight, ideas, vision, all kinds of creative good stuff. Philippians 2.13 says, For God is working in you, giving you desire and the power to do what pleases Him. And the point is that prayer isn't a crystal ball with answers to all of your questions. The discipline of prayer is not as concerned about your future as it is your present. God is at work changing you, conforming you into the image of Christ, creating you to be more God-like. And when you're changed, uh, you will look down and discover, I'm right where God wants me to be. Praise God. The third way to discover God's will is to faithfully put God first in every area of our lives. You want to put God first in the big things? Be faithful in the little things. And what it all comes down to is who's God? Is He God or are you playing God? Because uh, it's, a, it's a universal struggle of putting God first above our own selfishness and playing God. When Paul says, do not be foolish or unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He isn't talking about some hidden message the Ephesians are trying to figure out. The context is very simple. Be careful how you live. His main concern is how we conduct ourselves in our ordinary life. And he makes the same point in Romans chapter 12, and I'm rephrasing it a bit. If you want to discern the will of the Lord... Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. If you want to discern the will of the Lord, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Dita, can you read this one as well? If we seek first God's kingdom and righteousness, which is the will of God for our lives, then whatever choices we make concerning the future become the will of God for our lives. There are many pathways we could follow, many options we could pursue. As long as we are seeking God, all of them can be God's will for our lives. Although only one, the path we choose actually becomes His will. If God expects us to live obediently to His Word, and He expects us to live prayerfully with Him, and he expects us to
to live faithfully with Him first in our lives. Do you think it really matters which person we choose to date or which job that we take? Isn't God there with us in every choice we make already? I mean, with those three things established, uh, can't God bless you in any path that you choose to go down? It's like there's additional freedom when we're right with God. We have this additional freedom to choose. Gary Sitter, this author, puts it this way. God is thus surprisingly flexible about our future because he is supremely inflexible about our present. Once we seek first God's kingdom and righteousness and entrust our lives wholly unto him, the world suddenly becomes full of possibilities. So I hope I'm getting through there. We don't have to chase after God's will. We have to chase after God. And when we chase after God, we will be in the center of God's will. And whatever thing we choose, God is with us. And God is in it. And God can use all things together for good. Right? For those of us who are called according to His purposes. Okay. Bottom line. Folks, no fleece is needed. You have God's Word. Praise God. Right? You have the Holy Spirit speaking to you, right? You have the option to listen to Him. You have the choice to live for God and put Him first in every area of your life. Live like that and try not to be in the will of God. We think about the will of God like it's some kind of destination. But it's actually a state of being. We want to be in the will of God. And God wants His children to grow in faith to the point where we don't need fleeces. We don't need signs and wonders. The story of Gideon is not teaching that it's wrong to ask for confirmation. It's not. He's not saying it's wrong to ask for a sign. It just shows that our faith is weak. Right? And, and maybe we're immature. But you know what? That's the biggest lesson for me in this whole story about Gideon. Because it reminds me that God accepts us right where we're at. With our doubts, with our weak faith, He loves us, He's with us, He's for us. You know, sometimes he, he's, he's even doing a sign or doing confirmation because He's helping us along. You know, it's like we're His little kids and He's given us what we need to march on. But ultimately, our goal is just to trust Him emphatically. Your Word says it, Lord. That's it. It's settled. I don't need a sign. I don't need a confirmation. I'm going to do it. And that's what His hope is for us, that we would mature to the point that our trust in Him would grow so fast, vast, that we could step into anything He asks us to do. Because we love Him so much, and we know that He loves us so much. So soak yourself in the Word of God and in prayer. Put God first, and be confident. God is with you. And He's guiding you into His will every day. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Gideon and this lesson from him. And just a reminder that we don't have to be perfect to be used by God. We thank You, Lord, for the faith that You have given us. Uh, Lord, we believe, but Lord, would you help our unbelief? Would you give us the gift of faith in a greater degree? Lord, I know faith comes from trust, and trust comes from relationship with you. Help us, Lord, to deepen our relationship with you. That when you call and ask us to jump, uh, we know it's safe to jump. That you've got us. 
And I pray, Lord, for everyone who's in that place where God's calling them to jump. I pray, Lord, that your wind would be at their back. That you would calm their fears. And that you'd help them to make that leap of faith. Father, I know there's some people here today that are in a, a tough place. And there, the choices in front of them are not easy choices. But I pray, Lord, that uh, the fear of the choice would be removed. That they could run into your arms and feel your embrace. And then walk with confidence wherever you're leading them. So, Lord, I just speak a blessing over anyone today who's in that place where they're being called to step into something new. And I pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit over them. I pray for the peace of God to lead them to take that step. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Can I invite you to stand? And David and Dorothy are going to do the benediction. And I want to invite home group leaders or worship team to come forward. We want to pray for anybody who's in a tough place today, whether that is physically or emotionally or big life decision. We want to be here to pray for you. So can I invite uh, Semple Day, can you guys come down and any home group leaders that are here today, Donna? Thank you. 